Hi and welcome to this installation lecture uh, when Adolfo Sudoku, Sutuka is going to hold uh, in the subject architecture. He is going to present himself much better in a while and, uh, uh, and the title of the presentation is In Motion, the Architecture of Processes. It will be very interesting to listen. Uh, I am share, going to share this session today. Uh, I am Lena Abramsson, I am Vice Dean of the Faculty of Engineering here at Luleå University of Technology. Installation lectures are held by new professors. Uh, the new professor will be installed, is installed receiving his diploma uh, at our academic ceremony on Saturday. Uh, this year there is a total of 30 new professors that will be installed, seven women and six men. Uh, the installation lectures, uh, they are lectures uh, where we learn some basic of the research area, in this case architecture, and, but also learn some of the state of the art uh, in the field, uh, and also perhaps uh, learn something very interesting in the collaboration at the university. Uh, the lecture takes about 30 minutes, and there will be time for uh, questions afterwards. And I will try to uh, help you with the time, but you have perhaps keep the time yourself. Hmm? Okay. So, please, you can introduce yourself a little bit better. Okay. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lena. Um, actually, I would say 90% of the audience already knows me. So, my intro the introduction of myself will be very short. I'm Adolfo Sotok, I'm coming from Barcelona. I was trained as an architect. Uh, my PhD is on urban dis urbanism. And I've been working for the last, uh, I don't know, I would say almost 30 years, no, not so much, 25 years now in urban planning architecture. Um, I've been teaching in several institutions uh, worldwide. And uh, I took the chair professorship recently here at LTU with a lot uh, big share of motivation and illusion. So I'm very happy to be here and I thank you for the opportunity to share with all of you and to enjoy this uh, remarkable space, I would say, which I uh, didn't have the chance to, to, to know before. Some technical problems, so I will be standing here I was expecting to control the presentation from distance because I always like to look at the screen when I'm lecturing, but this time won't be that easy anyway. Um, before, uh, when, when I was uh, asked to, to prepare this presentation today, uh, I thought to myself, what could I thought uh, to myself, what could be a good start point for that uh, architecture here in Lulia? So. I decided to go out to the streets and find a good spot for architecture, from where to learn, from where to get the substance of architecture. And I found that this very corner, uh, Sturgotan with Smediagotan, could be the most urban, intense uh, spot here in Lulio. So I decided to sit there, take some pictures and some videos, and I realized that uh, this is uh, very much of a city landscape, in a way, of an urban environment. And um, when it comes to talk about urban environment and cities, it always uh, arises the, the question, what is urban, what is uh, uh, city? What is So this question is always in our field as architects. And uh, I thought to myself, to myself that uh, quoting here Mulright Butkin, who has been discussing about the politics and the social cont uh, contents of architecture and cities in relation with politics, could be a good start point to differentiate what is uh, uh, urbanization, what is cities, uh, what is uh, uh, politics, in a way. There are these three fields, polis, Civitas and Urbs, the, the Romans and the Greeks, they knew a lot about that. And in his view, uh, cities are very much of uh, processes. I mean, the physical substance, the materiality of cities, which is urbanization or urban environment, is our specific field of work as uh, architects, whereas the wider concept of Civitas 
of cities, they have very much to do with the processes all along time, the movement, the flows, the usage that societies uh, do of uh, such urban or material environments that we call in general cities. So as a starting point, I would like to pose here for discussion the confrontation of these two concepts, the politics, uh, the, the polis, which is the, 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 the social content of cities, in relation or in confrontation with the urbs, which is the urbanization which I feel is very much of my field of work, uh, uh, the physical content. And these two concepts, they converge or they come to a specific reality which is the city, the civitas. So uh, my point here today will be that uh, civitas, cities, are no more nor less than this merging of the societies, the way that uh, societies make use of a space, and the physical space itself. That's uh, why I'm uh, giving the name of in motion, uh, the architecture of processes, which I, in my view, it's the very substance, the very essence of, of cities. So my question here for the audience, or for, for all of you, if you want to share with me this discussion, is what is the motion in cities, we've seen people moving around, and cars, and traffic, and so on, and what is the uh, permanent in these processes, in this dialogue between the cities and the orbs. And looking to this picture, I would suggest you to make kind of a setback in time, a kind of archaeology and cities, and explore what is permanent and what is uh, not so permanent, or what is fluent in this specific urban environment. Olin's building uh, was not there forever. Uh, only in 2008, it was an empty spot of the city, and the locals, you know better than me, that uh, uh, previous to, to the current building, to the, to the existing building now, there was this big area for opportunity. It was an empty plot there. And you can see that there was this blind wall where some drawings were uh, painted on the wall. So this was kind of expecting opportunity for the city. So Olin's, which seems to me one of the strongest architectural presence in the city center today, was not there forever. It was not there only 10 years ago. But if we go even back in time, that empty spot was uh, built and there were other buildings at that uh, specific area. Hmm? Fritz Olson, this uh, very corner of Smediogatan with Sturgatan, was uh, one of the most uh, uh, important or significant uh, uh, shops or businesses here in Lulia, as, you, as we can see in the image of 1929. So you may say that uh, architecture, buildings, are not, at least, Olin's building uh, was not uh, permanent of the city, even though we tend to think that architecture is what remains permanent in cities. So, but even though, if we go a little bit back in time, not even Fritz Olson was there in the uh, beginning of the 20s. There was a shoemaker. There was uh, another building in a, more ma in, in a much more um, um, fragile architecture, I would say, not even stone, not even brick, just uh, wooden architecture, which in my opinion, it, it was a very good building as well in, in, in that sense. So, there is this corner which has been changing all along time. My point here is that architecture is not really the permanent substance in, in cities, in, in the urbs. But you may think that there are some buildings that they are there. They are there forever in our collective imagination, even the Ebenezer uh, church or couple. Uh, this is the building. This is the heritage building on the, uh, from where societies, in this case the Lulia society, has been building a kind of collective identity. It has been there for a long time. It has been there uh, at least from the beginning of the 20th, the 20th century. But if we go a little bit back in time, late 19th century, the building was not there. Not even 
in the couple, uh, and we can see that it's only a couple of blocks from here. Mm -hmm. It's there. So it's a strong presence uh, in terms of heritage, in terms of collective memory here in Lulio, and as far as I understand, it's even included in the catalog of uh, uh, architecture to be preserved here in the city. So in that case, not even the Ebenezer couple or, or church has been there forever. So my question here is, and, and you can see it here in these two images, uh, taken from the same spot. Hmm? What is the permanent in cities? Uh, what is what provides the real identity to cities, if not architecture? We, think to, we tend to think that uh, if we compare flesh and stone, and I could like to quote here Richard Sennett, his book, Flesh and Stone, it's the stone that uh, remains permanent in Syria and that gives this perpetual identity in Syria. And we see here, in the case of Lulio, that's not the case, as it is not in many cities in the world. Hmm? Cities are evolving entities. They are living uh, bodies that they change a long time, uh, luckily enough. Uh, so the question is, what is providing the identity or the permanence to our built environments? And I'm addressing the question to the audience. What could you say that uh, it's the permanent element here that it's providing the identity to the city? Anyone dares to uh, give an answer? That means the the street, or yeah, exactly. That's the that's the street, and y we can see it here from this image. Storgotan. Oh, we go back. This is Storgotan, same spot. And if we look at it from above, we see this very nice, I would say, access that is linking from the station, not really the railway station, but close to the railway station, till the residence, uh, the governor's residence at the very east, south, uh, uh, west, south end of the street. And it links the most significant buildings in Lulio, Petenskapenskus, the risk uh, bank, the city council, close to the dome. So this is the real substance, the real element that in Lulio is uh, providing the identity for this particular urban space. And it has been there since the very foundation of the city, since the very beginning of the city. This is an image of the li late 19th century. Not a single building that we see today was built at that time. Not the cathedral even, which is it was built at the beginning of the 20th century. Of course, not the risk uh, bank, not even the Stadt Hotel, where the elite hotel is today. So a lot has been changing a long time, but the streets, and more particularly, the grid, the plan, which was draft in 1858, it has been the continuous element, the one that has been providing or giving identity to this particular uh, city. Mm -hmm. So my point here is that architecture goes beyond buildings. It means something else. I mean, there is the architecture of the urban environment, the architecture of the cities that they uh, that uh, is also uh, uh, responsible in a way or is also drafting or shaping not only buildings but also the urban patterns or urban morphologies. You, we see here the previous drawing, the uh, description of the peninsula of Lulia for the beginning of the 50s here. So the existing elements are already described here. The, the the, the church, in, in that case, it was not the cathedral we see now, it's the San Gustav Church. Some of the existing blocks we can see very clearly differentiated too. I don't know if I get, yeah. No, I want here. Yeah? No, I don't want to draw here. Okay, sorry. Well. Anyway, <laughs> uh, we can see both different uh, urban fabrics, uh, the most dense one, the existing single family one, 
some of the existing topography, existing buildings, roads, water canals, I mean the existing geography, is somehow shaping or providing the information for the future development, development to come, which is this plan, 1858. It's funny enough, because we, I'm coming from Barcelona, did I mention this? I'm coming from Barcelona, and we pride ourselves in Barcelona of giving to the world, in a way the most uh, outstanding example of modern urbanism. This is the extension of the Champla Sarda. When it comes to architecture and you think of Barcelona, please forget about Gaudí. I mean, Gaudí is great, but our contribution to the world was, is not Gaudí, it's this plan here. This is together with Joseph Steuben plan for Berlin and maybe the commissioner's plan for Manhattan. It, was, it is one of the three big contributions to modern urbanization in the world. So, and we pride ourselves, and of course, as a professor there, as a student previously, I've been studying and talking and discussing a lot about this plan, which was drafted in 1859, a year after of Lulio's plan. So this is good, I mean, I feel excited about that. I'm coming from Barcelona and I see this plan, which was drafted a year before the Barcelona plan was drafted in Barcelona. So it's, it's good and it's part of a common uh, trend in the mid 19th century. Industrialization demanded for existing cities to grow, to expand. In the case of Lulio, it's very clear the connection between the economic uh, uh, cycles here in Norrbotten and the need to take out all the, all the mineral coming from the north through the harbour of Lulio. So very much of this grid has very much to do with the economic uh, optimization of urban landscape. But still it's very nice to see that uh, this very good, which is at the same time very good, it's a very good plan, was drafted a year before it was drafted in Barcelona. So I'm very happy to, uh, to, to, to see this connection between my own background and the future ahead I have here in the city of, of, of Lulio, in Norboten in, in Norboten in general. And this is the, the map that uh, Ildefon Sarda, who was the author of the extension plan for Barcelona, by the way, he was not an architect, he was an, an engineer. Mm -hmm. So this is something worth to mention as well. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the drawing, the description of the Barcelona plane that he did before the, the 1859. Mm -hmm. A very nice one, with a lot of coincidences or, or, or yeah, a lot of uh, similar ideas or similar ways of describing the territory the done here in Lulio, previous to the to the extension plan of the 58. So. I will elaborate a little bit more on this idea of what is the permanent, what is the identity of cities, the planning, the, 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 this grid in this case for these two cities, uh, by taking a couple of fragments of these two plans and by showing you the regulation plans that came after the drafting of the general idea. So after the plan is draft, is drawn, uh, some more instrumental, more uh, technical documents are required to move on with the urban development. In the case of Lulia, it was this plan of uh, 1922, uh, and in case of Barcelona, 1929. Still, we were a little bit after Lulio <laughs> in Barcelona, I mean. And what is the substance? What is described in these technical documents? What is required for a city to be built a long time? Three elements, very, very, very quickly. Streets, plots, and buildings. And by plots, I mean in land, land ordinances, uh, uses, and uh, parcellation in general. So I will refer to a street in first uh, place. This is the opening of Gran Via, one of the uh, main roads in Barcelona. Huh? You see here the first uh, action of, uh, the first statement on the territory is building infrastructure. Is uh, streets or avenues or roads, they are not only surfaces from on top of that we drive or we move around. It's the very basic grid of infrastructural grid 
uh, uh, that is providing the basic services, water, energy, sewage, and so on. So the first, in the case of Barcelona, the first big statement was building these avenues. And you see at the same time some plots on the left, some existing agricultural fields, some is buildings that are appearing, are, are being built in this process, this simultaneous process of opening up the infrastructure. And still today, this idea is there, Barcelona, the plan of Barcelona, the 1859 plan, is still enforced and the city is still developing, is still growing under that idea. The last neighborhood, so it's a plan of 150 years, is not a project, it's not a, a large building that is built in just five years and then becomes obsolete. In this case, we have been driving the city or designing the city for more than 150 years now. And you see some examples here. This is the last neighborhood, the technological district of Barcelona. It's called 22 Watt. And still they are following not only the same geometry, but kind of the same even urban regulations eh, when it comes to uh, densities, bulks, uh, flow area ratio, and so on. So, and for the case of Lulio, the the, the the case is a little bit different because, there, as, as I was showing you, there was an existing urban core here on the peninsula. So this is uh, Sturgotan. You see the Ebenezer uh, Church at the, top of, at the back of the image. And this is Sturgotan. Mm -hmm. And you see, at the time, this is a movie of the 30s uh, in, in here in Lulio. And you see that uh, there were existing buildings at the time when they were trying to implement the, the plant. Hmm? So, uh, as you see, in this case, there is an existing situation, urban situation. Some buildings are already there. So the work here is not to open new infrastructure, but to improve the existing one. Hmm? And you see from that uh, late uh, 19th century, 70s of the 19th century, the surface, the, 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 the road, was not even flat. Hmm. There was this topography which was very evident. At the end of it, you see the residence of the governor. First uh, actions were to make it flat and to collect rainwater on surface. You see there, at this part of the image, that there are some on-surface canals that are driving the rainwater uh, so it's a very primitive, a very initial sewage system, but still the need to collect and, and take care of water is there. So as I said, streets, they are not only spaces for movement, they are also infrastructural spaces. So in that sense, we architects have a very close connection with engineers. I don't see the boundaries between one field and another. Uh, as some of my colleagues, I must confess, they're back in Barcelona, they see. So, and this is uh, how uh, Storgotan looks like today. Mm -hmm. so it's a very nice pedestrian area, uh, not only a functional space, so there is also here after the years some symbolic meaning, some social meaning for this space to become this identity space for the whole city center of, uh, of Lulia. And uh, as I said, and I want to underscore this pretty because I, I think it's important, particularly when it comes to architecture at LTU, the engineering component of, of architecture and urban planning and city planning, it's, it's very important. Hmm? So as I said, in the case of Barcelona, there is a big discussion, super interesting discussion at this moment about uh, district, uh, central district heating and centralized infrastructure and everything happens below uh, surface level and a lot of technology is being implemented there. Uh, you see here some last uh, pilot projects by Cisco components in the city of Barcelona. But uh, you don't need to go there. If you walk a couple of blocks from here, you will see that Still, architecture and, and uh, infrastructure architecture, and I like to call it like that, because I, as an architect, I claim for infrastructure to be also part of our field. Hmm? is still very present there, and it's part of, the, of, the, of our task. And I'm happy that here at Lulio, we have a strong, uh, 
water group, but uh, many other groups working in energy and in, in some other fields that we, from the city planning or urban planning perspective, uh, do need for our, for our uh, task. Hmm? So, first component is streets. Second, plots. This is very interesting. It seems to me that uh, plots or the layout of, uh, of the land tell us a lot about politics, about society, about how the land, how the uses, how the property is distributed and is uh, shaping also the morphology of the city. If you track all the different plans that have been, been developed in, in, the, in, in the city of Lulio from the late 19th century till the mid uh, 20th century, you will see some slight changes, but very significant. Hmm? How the property is changing, and if we took a look, if we take a look to Storgotan from above, huh, it's the same transect I was showing to you in the previous uh, drawings in the previous maps. We'll see that. Uh, for instance, one of the most acknowledged jump examples of architecture here in Lulio, the shopping uh, center by Ralph Erskine, it's, uh, it was only possible by merging at least three different properties, three different plots at the Rotan uh, uh, block. Hmm? Same thing with Strand Galleria. Hmm? If you compare what was drawn in the in 22 and what is built in one single step today, you will realize that it was only possible by merging or uh, adding up different plots, different owners. Hmm? And uh, I would suggest you a, l a small exercise. Compare Strand Galleria in terms of architecture. Compare Strand Galleria and shopping and uh, you will come with some conclusions. What is the architectural quality of one operation and what is the architectural operation on, of the other one? And it has very much to do with dimensions, with the grain, with the texture of the buildings in relation with the plotting system. I cannot elaborate more on that. Maybe later on, if we have time, we can discuss about it uh, with, with the audience. Uh, but uh, even more interesting, some of the times, uh, this aggregation, this adding up of uh, plots of parcels, they go beyond the block and they overjump the streets. And uh, it, the it is the case of Esmedian Galleria. Hmm? They need to jump to get to the parking structure, parking on the other side of, of the streets. So there is this process of aggregation, of uh, enlarging the size of operations, which in my opinion has a very big impact in the city of Lulio, in the central part of, of the city of Lulio. So this is something to reflect. So what is the size of the city? What is the, what is the texture? What is the grain of the city? It, this is also architecture, in my opinion. And you might think, okay, this response or this is the logical consequence of this um, market-driven way of doing things. All you have been showing us is shopping centers or gallerias or these artifacts, but it's not necessarily the case. Take a look to Kultur Huset. Hmm? It is also part of this big uh, in intervention in the, in the city. So I'm not here uh, taking a stand, I mean, it is the way it is, eh? but we need to realize that, that this kind of uh, simplification, I would say, of the architecture in cities, in, in, in ways of making big things or acting big, it's somehow having a big impact in, in, in our cities in general. Uh, and it is the case also, of course, of the all uh, uh building of the uh, Hunden block. Hmm? This is the image by the time they were doing this this building, 2008. Hmm? And something very interesting to me, if you look at this image also, you will see that Storgotan, it's a little bit narrow at the end of the image. There were some buildings that were in the middle or, or were still placed or built on the space of a Storgatana, or on the, uh, on the road space. Mm -hmm. So this process of uh, changing 
the property and, and the plotting system of the city, it affects also the buildings themselves, eh? as far as the most of the times they are mm, uh, contradictory to, to the desire, to the project. The, the, there is this tension between the project, the ideal, and the existing urban fabric. Eh? And this confrontation or this contradiction a long time, it's also very interesting, it's shaping cities in a way. Finally, buildings, and I'm coming here to the, to the end of, the, of my uh, very brief uh, lecture, it was 30 minutes, so I'm close to it. Uh, buildings, of course, they are, in my view, the final stage of this linear process timeline in series. Hmm? Buildings are regarded to be our field of work as architects, and of course they are. Hmm? But uh, my point here is that they are not the only field of architecture. And of course, uh, we may think or we may have our own opinion about individual buildings, about individual interventions, but my point here is not about the quality of buildings themselves, but about the relation these buildings they established or they uh, create with the surrounding, with the city landscape. This is the important thing for me. We see here two different case studies, the Lulio and Barcelona. Huh? One of them being this uh, iconic building, well, both of them are, both of them are quite iconic, uh, high-rise buildings in relation with their surroundings. They build the corner, which are, corners are very significant in urban spaces. But the important thing here is in one case, the division between the private property and the public sphere is very clear. It's the facade itself and the street uh, goes uh, parallel to it. Whereas in the other case, the street crosses under the building. Hmm? Well, what we can see here in the Media Pro building in Barcelona. I'm not telling one thing is better than another. They, they, they respond to specific demands, context, situations, but it's important to think that buildings, they are not just objects, they establish and they root themselves into the urban space, and we need also to be aware of that. Other, uh, another example, uh, Storgotan, still this diverse architecture, if we want, uh, several buildings, uh, different times, different ages, but still some kind of common ground for them. There are some guidelines. The ground floor level is uh, for commercial shops, uh, businesses. The height of the buildings here are, is quite homogeneous, and there are these horizontal lines that somehow are giving some kind of consistency, I could say, to the urban landscape. Whereas in the case of, Bar in the case of Barcelona, the uh, strategy is another one, a totally different one. I mean, this volumetric uh, addition of volumes, and uh, again, I'm not telling one is best than the other. Uh, the point here is that this is done, conceived, designed by architects. Huh? We also need to be active in that. Uh, urban regulations and the control of urban morphology is also part of our work. Just as a brief conclusion and as a final remark, uh, four ideas I would like to, to underscore at this time. Hmm? First is the time of the police becomes space in the orbs. This relation between space and time is very interesting in my opinion and we can see here in Lulio that this is very clear. This is something we can really learn from. Civitas, the cities are processes through which polis, I mean the, the, the political understanding of societies, and the orbs, the physical space, they converge. And, and I like to think that architecture is a decoder I, I like to think, and I use architecture as a kind of translator of what is behind that, what are the societies that are shaping that particular morphology. The architecture of the city spans beyond uh, objects. I mean, architecture is more than buildings, it's mm, far more than that, as we were uh, discussing when it comes to streets and plots. And finally, streets, plots and buildings in my opinion, through their interaction uh, through time or a long time, they build and they weave the space in time uh, where we live in. So this is, I think I did it in 35 minutes. So now I will be happy to discuss with you if there are questions or comments or suggestions. Mm. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You.
It was a very interesting uh, lecture, and I'm sure there will be some questions or comments. <laughs> we'll have time during FICA time. <laughs> Well, then I uh, would like to say that uh, Lulu University of Technology is very pleased uh, mm. to have you as a uh, professor. And we look forward to uh, further important and exciting research and that uh, the subject of ar architecture will grow. Mm. But, and also to have uh, good collaboration and integration with the, 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 the rest of the university and especially from my own perspective also in the engineering subjects because we think it's architecture is an important subject in the engineering field here at our university. Mm -hmm. So I uh, have some flowers to give you and say welcome to Lulu University of Technology. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>